My name is Tracy Grimm. I'm the flight archivist at the uh, Baron Hilton Archives for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Libraries. Today I'm interviewing Captain Jean Cernan, Purdue Class of 1956 Electrical Engineering alumnus, as well as a member of the 1963 Third Class of American Astronauts. Captain Cernan served as the pilot for the 1966 Gemini 9 mission, as lunar module pilot for uh, the Apollo 10 mission in 1969, and a commander of the Apollo 17 in 1972. Captain Cernan, welcome, and thank you so much for taking this time to interview with us and for conducting part two of your oral history interview with the university. Tra uh, Tracy, it's my pleasure, and uh, after viewing the kind of things you're doing with the archives, uh, I'm not just uh, um, happy about what you're doing. I'm overwhelmed with what you're doing and some of the stuff, you know, from the mill you're here at the, to Neil Armstrong to all kinds of other, uh, mostly Purdue graduates and alumni who have done something significant. I, I'm, I'm impressed because uh, at this point in my life I have nothing left to give future generations except hopefully a little inspiration. Uh, you know, I've always said the dreamers of the day are the doers of tomorrow, and, and, you know, if we can inspire those young kids to, to dream about doing what they didn't think they could do, yeah. uh, such as, you know, when President Kennedy challenged the country to go to the moon back in 1961, I was one of those who, I wasn't in a space program, I, I was one of those who who uh, thought he was asking us to do the impossible, to ask us <coughs> what couldn't be done. Uh, but the rest is history. So I want those kids to know that they can be, and they, they can be what they want to be. They can do what they want to do. I, uh, a phrase I'm, I didn't originate, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to quote, is, is always shoot for the moon. Because even if you miss, you will land somewhere among the stars. Yeah. That goes along with my, something my dad always used to tell me as I grew up, just go out and do your best. You're not going to be better than everyone at everything, mm -hmm. but sooner or later, you're going to surprise yourself. He was right. I did. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your generosity uh, to the archives, and, and that's our mission is to make these things that you're giving us, the documents available for students, and to let them see and be inspired and to learn more about that story. Yeah, there, you know? it's, it's not, there's, you know, forget the monetary value, uh, and, and the historical value is significantly important. But I, there's another value, the inspirational yeah. value. That's what I really believe is the most yeah. important thing about yeah. these archives back yeah. there. I think you're right, yeah. Captain Cernan, in the first interview that you did with Purdue, you talked a lot about your childhood, your parents, um, what Purdue meant to you, the education you got here, and how that le you know, led you on to what you've done in your lifetime. And you talked about the astronaut selection process. So today I want to pick up where you left off with Katie, and I want to talk a little bit more, have you talk a little bit more about um, your experiences in the missions of, of the space program. So my first question, when you arrived at NASA in 1963 as a member of that sixth, that third class, with uh, Roger Chaffee was, was, was with you from Purdue. That's right. right. And, and Gus Grissom was already there, and Neil Armstrong was, was already there. there. What I'm wondering, you, if could you talk a little bit about the relationship between you, Gus, Neil, and Roger as you were there working in the space program? Was it was it something unique between you because you were from Purdue or? What was it like, you know, the four of you? We, we, shared, we shared some background being from Purdue, but uh, the one thing that I discovered very early, uh, we were all individuals uh, pulling the wagon in the same direction, but competing to be the lead horse, competing for flights all the time. And so the fact that we went to Purdue was important because that's one of the reasons we got there, quite frankly. I, I, I've always said I took those first steps into space to the moon right here at Purdue and, and never realized it because there was literally no space program. And certainly I wasn't ever going to be part of it because by the time I got, uh, I got good enough and qualified to be uh, part of the program, there wouldn't be anything left to do. The pioneering would be over. So 
the Purdue Association didn't have that much to do with it. Let's, let's take Gus. Uh, he was one of the original seven. These guys were almost immortal before uh, they ever flew in space. And uh, Gus was a big, big time competitor, a good guy, outstanding aviator. He flew on that uh, second mission, uh, suborbital following Al Shepard, uh, uh, and, uh, and then flew again on, uh, on the first Gemini mission uh, as a commander of the flight. And, but Gus was a little aloof. You know, we were, the, we were the, I was part of the third group. Neil was part of the second group of nine. Uh, we were chosen a year after that group of nine, and we were the new kid on the block. We were the neophytes, you know. We were the mm -hmm. kids that were supposed to listen and not talk. And, and Gus was busy in his own right, because once, even, I found this out later, is once you get involved in a flight, I mean, you are dead on focused. And, and both with your colleagues in the office, you know, they're doing one thing, but you are focused on 100%, 110% on what you're doing. Uh, and if you're not, uh, you, you, you're probably not going to keep the seat that you got on that flight. You know, even to the extent, I might add, that uh, that your family suffers because you're gone seven, eight days a week, literally. You're testing. You're, 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 you're taking your engineering background as long as with your aviator experience, and you're going to the contractors. You're doing everything from patting people on the back and say, don't forget to do a good job. And they did take ownership. Everyone who yeah. put a nut and bolt in, in, a, in a Mercury Gemini and Apollo spaceship owned it. I mean, they were responsible for your success and safety. <coughs> you did everything <coughs> from, from, you know, that a boy to some of the workers around the country to, uh, uh, to taking your engineering background and integrated it into design development with the engineers who are designing and building a spacecraft. Because, you know, every engineer, <coughs> we, we're all, you know, we're all good, what are you doing? Someone designs this system, someone designs this one, environmental control, electrical system, whatever it is, and they put it in this box called the Apollo spacecraft. Either it doesn't physically fit, it doesn't play together, the combination uses too much power. So you've got to let them know how you're going to use this equipment. Right. And you're in a hard suit, which makes it very stiff, and you can't reach this, so they got to move. So it's a combination of their talents and their knowledge and their expertise and your experience, which eventually comes out as a, a flyable spacecraft. And as a result, as I say, you're gone. You know, your, your kids skin their knees. Your wife's got to take them to school, uh, you know, take out the guard, all these things. And I spent some time in my book giving credit to the wives, who I don't think have ever been... Uh, uh, given enough credit for the role they played while we were out doing our thing. And so getting back to your question, you know, I, I, Neil and I, Gus was a little aloof. He was always busy doing something. I never really got to know Gus that well. Uh, even the rest of the original seven were all individuals. Uh, Wally Shira uh, became our den mother, got to be great friends with Wally. Eventually when I backed up Alan Shepard, it broke through that wall of ice he had around him. I backed him up on Apollo 14. He and I became the best of friends. They were a generation. Most of those guys were 10 years older than me, a whole half a generation older. And they, they were the first. They were the king of the mountain. And we were the, uh, we, we were the nuggets, as we call it in the Navy, you know, the, the young kids that uh, just do what I say and, you know, stay out of my way kind of thing. Neil and Roger... I knew neither one of them very well. Didn't know Roger at all here at Purdue. He graduated a year after I did. Neil was here and then went to Korea for, I guess, a couple of years. Came back and uh, graduated the year before I did. <coughs> I, may, <coughs> I may have run into Neil somewhere along the line because he eventually married uh, a, a, a lady who went to high school with my uh, college roommate and fraternity brother. And so there was that association. Uh, but beyond that, no, except for the fact that Neil and I, <coughs> early on, before either one of us flew, shared an office. Oh. And uh, we had some fun doing that. We were 
we were big investors, in, you know, with our with our extra hundred dollars we had every month, and and I'll, I'll never forget that. Yeah, but we shared off. And once he got a flight, it was the same old story. You know, he's gone. He's doing his thing, and uh, the totally hundred percent focus, and that's just the way it was. You can see that in his papers, and I'm sure in yours. Yeah. And it's I don't it, know Neil, when you slept. Neil was a consummate engineer, and I like to think of him. And I got Neil and I. You know, spent time together early on, but then you know he went from his Gemini flight to Apollo 11, and he's just overwhelmed during that period of time. But then Neil and I got back together, uh, you know, six, eight, ten years ago because he was out of program, I was out of program. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. We went to Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, a couple, three times uh, uh, together with Jim Lovell. We uh, we testified in front of Congress. We spent a lot of time together. We truly did become very, very good friends. We re re really cemented a relationship. But Neil, in, as well as a, a uh, an engineer who well as was, you know, he his everything he said was founded on facts, not speculation, facts. And to do that, he had to be a historian as well. And most people don't think of Neil that way, but he knew, and it wasn't just engineering history, it was literature history. He knew, he, I don't know where he found the time to, yeah. but, but he had a, un, um, it was, his brain was a sinkhole. I mean, it took it all in and remembered it. And a lot of people don't remember him that way, but uh, anyway, that was our association when we were down here. And uh, I'm making too much noise with this. Uh -huh. uh, and, and so, uh, we, we ended up all doing our own thing, but at some point in time, uh, it's like any other organization, w those with common interests attracted each other. And there's some guys that you fly with uh, who maybe you talk to once a year. Other guys who maybe you didn't fly with, like Jim Lovell and I, and our very, very, very good friends. The guy I walked on the moon with and, and I are good friends and we, you know, he did a wonderful job, and we shared a lot together. But uh, it, that was it. And it, people find that funny. But people are attracted to each other by who they are, what they are, what they believe in. And, and I think that's why Neil and I, and Roger, Roger was my next door neighbor at, uh, in Houston when we got in the space program. His kids played with my girl. And, you know, that's how our relationship evolved. His wife and I today, a former wife, his widow, and I today are the, are the best of friends. Uh, oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, those things evolve. They just don't instantaneously, just because yeah. you're, you're selected for the program doesn't mean you're instantaneous friends who respect and know and love each other. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. It's that way in any profession. Right. You're hu human beings. <coughs> Pardon? You're human beings. You were human beings. You're human beings. beings. That's right. You You're not heroes. programmed. And that was yeah. the real key to, to what we did. And as I say, what's important, Apollo 13 is a good example. All along the way, we're all competing with each other on a very friendly basis. But we were all competing to get the next available seat that was going to take us into space on whatever, going wherever. Right. When when the Apollo 13 uh, near tragedy happened, I can tell you, in, indeed, we were all hitched to the same wagon, and we were all pulling in the same direction with as much strength uh, and, and effort as we could muster. Because that's when we, when something like that happened, that's when we came together. When, when the Apollo 1 fire, in which we lost Gus and Ed White and Roger Chaffee, it was the same thing. We, we, did truly come together. And I remember in February of that year, 1967, we were burying, burying our guys. Uh, Gus and Roger went to Arlington and Ed White went to West Point, walking behind uh, uh, Roger's uh, casket driven by, you know, uh, with the black horse, horse-drawn carriage. And, and, and I kept thinking, uh, are we burying our friends or are we burying the entire Apollo program? Because we hadn't gotten an Apollo spacecraft off the ground and we lost two of our, three of our colleagues. You know, I think 
we weren't invincible. Uh, and as you said a minute ago, we were humans. And, and I often get the question, did we, did, we, did we ever think we might not come home? Yes and no. And I don't know how the other guys felt. Yes, I recognize the fact that that might happen. Uh, but, uh, but I didn't go to the moon not to come home. I, I didn't go to the moon to be a martyr. I was going, I had a spacecraft built by the best people in the best country. They gave me the best hardware, which they assured me would work, and the rest was up to me. And, and I was good enough. And if you're not a little arrogant, right. if you don't know you can do it better than it's ever been done before, you should be doing something else. So we, we probably all had some feelings we might lose somebody on the way but not before we ever left the ground. And that was a real tragedy because, as they say, Roger and I did become very close, family-wise and otherwise. We hunted together. Uh, we partied together. We did everything, you know, young, quote, kids at 25, 30, 35, and those are young kids, by the way, uh, do in their lifetime. Yeah. So that was our, that was pretty much our relationship. That must have been very difficult. I mean, and then yet yeah, you've got to carry on. You've got to keep going. You know? I'll never forget, uh, and you know, you, you forget things unless people, quote, force you to remember them. And uh, they're, they're doing a, a little documentary of my life based upon, upon my book. And we went back down in uh, Nassau Bay in Houston where we lived and Roger lived next door. And they wanted, the question was, because the movie is supposed to not be about technology, it's supposed to be about who I am, what I am, what, what it was like. And we went back to where I live. And Roger, I lived here and Roger lived over there. And what was it like that night you came home? See, Tom Stafford and John Young and I were doing the very same test in California that the Apollo 1 crew was doing at Kennedy. Very same test. We got the word in the middle of it that what had happened. And so we jumped in our airplane and uh, flew home. I flew with Tom coming back at 45,000 feet across the, uh, you know, the deserts of New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and didn't talk to each other much, but I kept wondering and dreading what I was going to do when I got home. And, and, the, and the question was, they wanted, how did you feel when you came back here and you're in your flight suit and there's your house? And when I got back there, uh, I knew where my wife would be and, I, and there were cars all over the place. Of course, Martha had already known Mike Collins was the first to have to tell her. And, uh, and I walked across the, uh, the, uh, our front lawn and their front lawn and I just revisited that time when I, I don't even know who opened the door, but I walked in and saw Martha. And, uh, you know, I would, would never have spent time thinking about that unless someone asked me about that. But those were, those, those were tough times. A lot of things, all people remember is la-di-da, we walked on the moon and one thing or another. But there's so many untold stories out there that may never be told. Uh, because I keep going back to what you said. We were human beings. We weren't robots. We were people who had feelings and thoughts and cut yourself, you bleed. You know, we had kids. We had bills to pay. We had, just like anybody else, quite frankly. And yet we were challenged to do what had never been done before. We were challenged to go where humans have never been before. And how do you not respond yeah. to that? Uh, so here I am, you know, I can go back from the days I spent at Purdue and from the time I graduated. I've, I've repeated this many times. My dream was to fly airplanes off aircraft carriers. My dad's dream was to have me get the education. He never had an opportunity to get. I left here in 1956 with orders to Pensacola, Florida for naval flight training in one hand and an engineering degree in the other hand. Those dreams came together and the rest of my life, indeed, I'm not kidding, and I'm not diminishing it's, it, what I've done. It's a fairy tale. You could not have written a fictional novel that included some of the things that, good and bad, that have happened in my life. 
so here I am. And thank you. Thank you for sharing these, that story and, 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 and for everything that you've been talking about. Before I ask you about the Gemini uh, 9 mission, I, I have another question that I, I've, I've seen in your papers that you've donated to the archives, that during the Apollo program, you had numerous interactions with congressmen, senators, governors, Ronald Reagan, um, the vice president, Spiro Agnew. Could you say a few words about this public relations, this sort of this aspect of your work while you were there at NASA? Trying to keep the, was it trying to keep, help keep the it, program the, the funded? Country, yeah, it, yeah, a combination of all those things. It, the, I mean, it just, you know, take yourself back if it's possible. And the President of the United States gets up in front of Congress and eventually at Rice University in Houston and said, you know, hey folks, America is going to go to the moon. And, and you, you, you got to recognize the atmosphere in which he had, was bold enough to say that. It was a, quote, terrible 60s. Campus unrest, civil strife, the beginning of what I call a very unpopular war. The Soviet Union owned space. They put up Sputnik. They, 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 the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, went around the world once. Uh, they could put the grand piano in space on their big rockets, and ours were falling, you know, blown up and falling down in the Atlantic. And uh, our big success, when the country really needed a hero, is when we launched Alan Shepard back uh, in May of 1961. And uh, he didn't get into orbit, but that was a plan. He and Gus were going to fly the first two suborbital missions. We took things one at a time. Let's make sure this works before we stick our neck out a little bit further. John Glenn didn't fly in orbit uh, for till February of the following year when we actually felt we were, you know, we, we put safety of the human being first and foremost uh, in, in all of our flights. We, we flubbed up a little bit along the way and we lost some people. Uh, and, and when we look back at some of those accidents, they all could have been prevented if we were smart enough to know, to think about it ahead of time. Uh, but uh, that was the time. Shepard went up. He was a national hero. He was almost an international hero because, remember, the rest of the free world, you know, Soviet Union was communist world, all of a sudden, the owner, the leader of space technology owned the world at that point in time and, and literally literally the Western world, all of Europe, everywhere else was looking at us. What are you going to do about it, America? We were the only ones who had the capability to respond to the Soviets. What are you going to do about it? And so when Shepard went into space, I think it overwhelmed a lot of a lot of people who were so focused on getting into space how the public reaction was overwhelming. And that public reaction never stopped. And when Kennedy, three weeks, three weeks after Alan Shepard went up and came down, 16 minutes in space, guess we're smart enough to go to the moon. He's challenged the American people to go to the moon. And what was important, and I love these words, not because it's easy, but because it is hard. I think that, I think people took that little message to heart. And, uh, and and we went on from there. Overtook the Soviets, and uh, but but the space program, uh, particularly uh, right on through the first landing, Neil's landing on the moon, the the public response was overwhelming. Kids got out of school. They, they, they you know, parents kept them out. They had assemblies to watch people launch in space. Uh, the reporters were sitting outside your house when you. Uh, you went into space. I mean, it was just overwhelming. And so when I got in this program, it's just not me, but all of us, the, the, the new kid on the block, we'd have to go out and it, everybody wanted something. Every congressman, every senator, every, every president, everybody wanted an ast astronaut to be at a peach festival, at, at, his, his, right. at his grandkids' school, at something. So it, we were there to put a program together to go to the moon. And so they came up with, we call it a, a, a week in the barrel. One guy, generally the new kids, one guy will go out, quit everything else he's doing, 
for one week and give a speech, talk, visit a high school, go to a peach festival, whatever was required to respond to the public and to give them an astronaut. Because even though when I had a program, even though none of my group of 14 had flown, we were instant heroes because we were astronauts. Wow, we hadn't done a doggone thing. And so the people out there responded. Plus, uh, you're right, funding, is, it's always competitive to continue to get funding. So if a senator, a congressman, someone of significant importance who had an impact on the NASA budget, and they asked for an astronaut, they got one. So along with everything else we were supposed to do, and I can remember the first time I went out, Connecticut Aviation Week, and I was asked to give a, a talk, tell them what, what we were going to do. Gemini hadn't started. What we were going to do in Gemini, Mercury was over, and how we were going to get to the moon. Someone in NASA wrote that speech for me. I was introduced by the governor of Connecticut. I never met a governor in my entire life. Hell, I was just a young, snotty-nosed Navy lieutenant. The governor's introducing me like I'd done something, and I hadn't. And I started, I've never, and I've never been good at it since, and I started reading, and, and, I, and I somewhere, and my knees are going like this, you can almost hear behind the podium. And I started reading, and I said, I didn't even know what I was reading or talking about. I said, I know more about what just, I'm supposed to, I took the paper and I just looked at the people, and I started talking to them, like you and I are talking, me to you. Folks, here's what we're gonna do. It's not gonna be easy. Uh, it's gonna change along the way. Uh, we're gonna try and uh, build a bridge from Mercury to Apollo and with a program called Gemini. And I just went on and I talked to him. I, I've, I've, never, I've never read a piece of paper on stage since, with one exception, and that's I had to stay on time for Neil's uh, eulogy. But other than that, uh, it's, so yes, we had other requirements on our lives, and our families had other requirements because, you know, the wives were hit with a lot of this as well. And you know, people think, oh, we went to a, a PR school, we went to speech school. We, you know, we, we no, we were who we were, and we did what we had to do. We had to respond to the public, to the press had to respond politically, and had to respond to the job that someone gave us. Fun, busy. Thirteen years of my life that went by so fast. It was like thirteen years of my life that was cut out. I lived this fairy tale, and then I got back to the real world. And I don't know where that time went. I, I, I really don't. It, it's just unbelievable. Thank you. And along the way, you know, you fly, and then you're put on parade around. We went around around the, the country, we went around the world. After every flight, you go somewhere because everybody, now it was not just America. The whole world wanted a piece of you. They wanted to see, feel, and touch. They wanted to hear you. I mean, whether it was the Philippines, Indonesia, Frankfurt, Georgia, it didn't make any difference where you were an international figure. Since you mentioned that, I'm going to skip ahead and to one of my other questions. With What was it like to be in Moscow or to be in the Soviet Union with your, yeah. with your competitors? Uh, yeah. Weren't you there we were, in 69? We were, we were right? at war yeah. with the Soviet Union that whole period of time in the 60s. By, but, you know, we, no one fired a gun. You know, unlike, unlike the World War I, World War II, or any other world wars in history, we didn't destroy millions of cities and kill millions of people. But yet we were at war with these guys. And yes, they were our competitors. And no, we really didn't get to know them personally, but we shared, okay. we, not early on, but we shared, we shared a lot together. And then it, things softened up in the latter part of the 60s and early 70s, we started talking about a, after Apollo was over, 72, and, and you know, we started talking about the possibility of a joint mission with the Soviet Union. We still had some extra Apollo hardware because Apollo 20 and 18, 19, 18, 19, and 20 were eventually canceled. And so I, I was the odd man out on Apollo, on Apollo Soyuz. We had a crew. 
We had a backup crew and we had three-man support crew. But I worked with both the crews and, and the uh, engineering team as, because of my background experience. And so I, I was the odd man out. I, I think the Russians always thought I was CIA, but it didn't make any difference to me. <laughs> uh, and a uh, in, couple interesting things. As a result, in working on uh, Paulo Soyuz, uh, uh, when I went over there, I realized Al Bean and I, out of those nine people plus me, were the only two who had walked on the moon. And the, the, the Soviets, people, just like people around the world, were, were, were just were overwhelmed with the fact that here's two human beings that had walked on the moon. I mean, that still overwhelms people today. You know, people ask you, you meet people today, even today's generation, well, did you fly in space? Oh, how wonderful. Well. But did you go to the moon? Yeah, I went to the moon. That's great. But did you actually stay at the moon? Yeah, yeah. But did you land on the moon? Yeah, I landed on the moon. And then the final question is, but did you actually get out and walk on the moon? It's like you never satisfy their hunger. It's never good enough until they know you've actually walked on the moon. And it was sort of that way. Soviet people really recognized and it was a great experience for me. I went to the Soviet Union probably eight times in two years, and we had, we had them over here quite a bit. Now, the outgrowth of that was not just, and by the way, that was in the Brezhnev era. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, big time Soviet, communist Soviet Union. And, uh, uh, and we, we met him, you know, because uh, it was a big deal. It was a big thing between Nixon and Brezhnev at that time. It was going to hopefully bring us a little bit more heart. Sort of a, a, sort of a breakthrough on the Cold War. And it did, I think, because the history and the spirit of, although it doesn't seem like it today in 2014, but the spirit of the cooperation has lived on, and the association between the astronauts and the cosmonauts uh, uh, is, that, that developed still exists. And I got to know several of the cosmonauts, got to be friends with several of them, good friends. And they were in my home, I was in their home. We shared secrets with each other that we wouldn't have talked about mm -hmm. and they'd never admit uh, in, in, in public. Uh, it, this little book is from Alexei Leonov. Uh, that's his signature. And uh, he and I became great friends. He actually was one of the two Soviet pilots on the Russian side of the Apollo Soyuz mission. And he got this, gave me this book, and it's signed by a lot of the, a lot of the astronauts, you know, of, of that period. Apparently, a book they put out, for mm -hmm. you know, historic and PR purposes. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting, uh, Leonov was the, was 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 going to be the cosmonaut, who was the person to step on the moon during their lunar program, until we, till they had some problems with the rocket development and we passed him up. But he was the first human being to walk in space. So you had quite a bit in common. He, but he was out for about 10 or 12 minutes and it took him about three or four minutes to get out and you know, eight or 10 minutes to get back in. It, it was a real hair raising thing for him. No one had ever done it before. And we didn't really know a lot about what went on. But he was the first Ed White was the first American, was out for 20 minutes. Now I'm out there for two and a half hours and ran into all kinds of trouble. That's another story. But we did have something in common. And so we could share it. We could yeah. talk about it. And it, it was like you and I talked, as friend to friend, because we became great friends. And I'd say, well, when you had to deflate your suit, I mean, let's face it, that's the only way you could get in. He said, that's the only way I could get in. I said, that's, an, that's next to the most dangerous thing you can possibly do, but that's what he was confronted with. And he was interested in some of the problems I had because I was on an extended EVA out there where the laws of ocean, you know, laws of Mr. Newton took over that we didn't anticipate and expect. And I don't know why we weren't smart enough to do that. So we shared a lot in common. We would talk about, we, we talk about things like Cuba, his feelings on Cuba and his feeling on religion, things that you'd never talk about. So 
yeah, the outgrowth of Apollo Soyuz was a great friendship with many of these folks that exist today. The, the first woman in space, Tereshkova, Valentina Tereshkova. Yeah, she's in uh, I got a chance to meet her. She's in here. And, and she's my age now. And, but what a great lady. And, and, and we, you know, she had a lot of problems. She was a parachutist. She got sicker than the devil on her flight. But she was, the Soviets were big on first. So she was the first woman in space. But she and I are kissing cousins now, you know, and don't see her every four or five, six years somewhere. But that's a relationship that came out of this. You know, it, it, the best people to people program this country has ever been involved in. You know, it's, it's a shame that politics gets in the way of those relationships sometimes. But the relationships, I think, will outlast uh, mm -hmm. the politics involved. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for talking about that. Since you brought up your, your spacewalk, I brought this picture because when I see this of you out there, it is, looks so frightening. And I know from what, I, you know from what you've talked about how you know, there were so many problems that you encountered for the first time <laughs> and so many changes had to be made. How, could you talk a little bit about that experience? Well, first of all, it's one of the few pictures that came back because uh, when I had a camera that was mounted on a spacecraft and took it off and handed it to Tom Stafford, he went to grab for it. Zero gravity hit with his big glove-covered hand. I saw it come out the cockpit and I went to reach it and I hit it and long gone. Uh, but yeah, this is, I was the third human being to get out of a spacecraft and the first to do anything beyond just get out. Now what Ed White was wonderful, 20 minutes, he had a little air gun, he could control the space, it was wonderful, he stayed out in front of the spacecraft. My job now was to be out there daytime, nighttime, a couple full revolutions, and, it, and let me tell you, everything is different at night. I'm a, I'm a carrier pilot. I gotta tell you, landing aboard a carrier at daytime is challenging. Landing aboard a carrier at night is hair raising. That's when you find out who you are. You know, when you look over your shoulder, it's just you and your maker, and you're in the middle of the ocean somewhere. You know, you find out who you are. You're gonna do it or not do it. And, and so nighttime in space, walking in space, brings on a new level of challenge as well. And, and I was out there to basically assemble an uh, astronaut backpack that I was going to fly around, and, around the world in. It was, uh, it was not that far advanced, but it was a big step from what we had done outside of spacecraft. We never really had much experience. The suit was like plaster of Paris. You get out there in zero gravity, and it, this, this umbilical, I'm still tied to the spacecraft at that point in time, is like a snake, and, and you touch something, it touches back, and you move out here, and you, you tumble, and the bottom line was, uh, yeah, I, uh, I had a lot of problems uh, because we hadn't anticipated some of the action and equal opposite reactions that were going to occur, and my visor got all fogged up. Uh, and I call that, uh, that chapter in my book is Spacewalk from Hell. And in retrospect, uh, and get back in a spacecraft was difficult. We knew it was going to be difficult because I'm a little bit big and, and it, it, that was tough. It, it, it was living hell for a while getting back in, but obviously, you know, you only got one place to go. You don't have any choices. There's no why in the road. And, uh, Space, spacewalk from hell is probably a good example. And, and I never, same old story, I never not intended to get home. Uh, but I found afterwards that uh, there was some consideration if, because as I say, we were out, we were in new territory. We were never, had this stuff is where man has never been before or barely been before. and. Uh, you know, there was some consideration, at least discussions about the fact, if there was a problem I had and if I couldn't get back in, Tom Stafford may have had to, you know, cut the umbilical. You know, I never considered that. And, and, and Tom 
Tom has always told me, Edgy and I never would have done that. Man, I wouldn't come home without you. And about two years later, I heard on the Discovery Channel, well, you know, if Gene's dangling out there on the, on the, uh, on the umbilical, and, and I got to leave the hatch open, and hell, and, you know, he's going to burn up, and then the fire's, I'm going to, you know, you know, I might not have had any choice. I said, Tom, you. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, that was an experience that uh, I, I guess, and I don't want to overdo it, but it could have cost my life, and that would have, that really would have put a stopper in the space program. Uh, I, th I think determination to, quote, succeed, however you describe success, is, is, is important. And when I got home, I, I uh, well, to give you an idea how hard I worked uh, out there, I had, I had lost 13 pounds in a little over two and a half hours. And it was a three-day mission, but I lost all that weight in, in, in those three hours. Uh, because when I landed on a carrier, my, I was ankle deep in water, my own water, in the boots. And then he dumped it out, he dumped all his water out. Uh, I felt I was a failure. And let's face it, I, I was a rookie. Uh, I was the, because of certain consequences, I, I, I was the second of our 14 to fly. And I, I, I most likely was not the second most qualified, because everyone else had gone to test pilot school. I had not. I want to notice a few guys who didn't. Uh, a lot of those guys in that group of 14 had just were head and shoulders over me in terms of experience. I was one of the younger guys, but it this fell on my shoulders. And I really, I really was pretty well down because I failed. I, I failed, I failed my, I failed to do what I was sent up to do, and I knew I could do it if I had another chance with what I knew then. Same old story, Monday morning quarterback. And, and, and I guess I was really down on myself for a couple reasons. Would this mean I'd never fly again? Uh, you know, I, I didn't bring back the bacon like I was supposed to. And fortunately, or unfortunately, but fortunately for me, the next two flights had spacewalks on them. Gemini 10 and Gemini 11, Mike Collins and Dick Gordon. They had different projects. It wasn't to fly this astronaut maneuver, but they had different, different uh, uh, objectives. But they all experienced the same problem. So they didn't fix. They and they didn't couldn't. Address. And even Dick Gordon yeah. couldn't finish his EVA. Yeah. And no, because we, you know, we were flying every two months. Uh -huh. We didn't time. get a chance to figure out what really, yeah. Yeah. what we really learned until yeah. three flights later. Yeah. And so that vindicated me in a way because they indeed had the same, well, hey, yeah. hey, folks, stop. You know, it wasn't just Gene Cernan because look what happened to, to Mike and Dick. So stop. Let's figure out what we do. We got one more Gemini flight. Let's see if we can solve this EVA problem. Yeah. And we did. We went back in and we developed underwater training, developed shoes to stand in, which would hold our position. We could pick up 18-wheeler trucks if we had to then, but unless you got some place to perch, perch your feet on and hold and whatever, you, you're just helpless out there. You're just another moving body. You know, this movie Gravity came out. Now, yeah. it, it, it went a little Hollywood, but the simulation was very realistic. It's, it, that's the kind of thing you would run into, the tumbling and whatever. You know, I uh, being vindicated by the next two flights, the spacewalks, we went to solve the problems on Gemini 12, and we did. We designed some slippers that you could put your feet in, that you could have some purchase, and did underwater training, and changed the mission to see if we could put round, round pegs and square holes and so forth, and we did. And we went, we left Gemini then having solved all the problems, rendezvous, spacewalk, long duration flight that we needed to do when we moved on to Apollo. Mm -hmm. Great. I have one more question about this picture. When I look at it at the blackness, I, how did you feel when you stepped out there? I mean, it's just black. It's, there's nothing. Well, it, you know, what it, you know, can you describe? You know, the reason space is black on the moon, it's not dark. The sun is shining on you. But the sky is not blue because on Earth here, there's, it, the, the sun is reflected through the atmosphere. But now, 
There's nothing. There's nothing. Whether you're on the moon or walking in space around the world. It's, you know, from the moon I call that, well, it's defined, you know, infinity. What's the definition of infinity? Nothing. I call it the endlessness of space and the endlessness of time. And you don't get an appreciation for that blackness that surrounds you when you're just going around the world until you go to the moon and you see the earth three-dimensionally moving with beauty and splendor beyond your comprehension out there. Uh, that didn't bother me because the sun was shining during the day. I was out there daytime and nighttime. At nighttime, I had stars all over the place. Daytime, and the moon was out during Gemini 9. So that, but that didn't give me that much light. But uh, the thing when I first opened a hatch, all we had was a little window in the Gemini spacecraft, and we had less room for the two of us than you and I have at this table. I mean, we were pretty comfortable together. <laughs> yeah. I opened the hatch and I stepped out in blackness over Hawaii, and it's dark down there, I tell you, it's dark. And all of a sudden this magnificent sunrise came up, you know, and there it is, the, 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 the the light blues and the darker blues and the shades of gold and then all of a sudden boom the sun comes and I'm and I'm crossing the coast of California. I walked across. I walked from from Los Angeles throughout through southern United States across the coast of Mexico in less than 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes I was across the Atlantic, and there was Los Angeles. I could see LAX, the airport. I can you know and the next thing you know I'm crossing across. Arizona, and, and I was taking pictures. I got a picture of Baja down here, and you know, it, it was just mag. All of a sudden, you got open that hatch out there, and and you got the whole world in front of you. That's what you think until you go to the moon, and then you realize there's more. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that as another point, transition point. Could you describe your feelings, your feelings, as you actually touch that lunar module down onto the moon for the first time? You know, describing feelings uh, is very difficult. And, you know, you can't, those kinds of emotions, you can't use a phrase or a few words. There's, there's nothing that you just have to think about it, you know, reminisce. Uh, I'd, I'd been to the moon once, Apollo 10. Uh, flew the lunar module. Uh, came down within 47,000 feet. And when you go a quarter of a million miles away from home and get down to 47,000 feet, that's pretty close. And with the mountains, I remember I said uh, it, it, to Charlie Duke, our Capcom, Charlie Weir, down a mama, among them, meaning I, I felt like I needed to pick up my feet to keep them from scraping on the mountains, and you're going pretty fast at that point in time. Across, the low point was across the landing site for Apollo 11, where we did a lot of radar checking out, one thing or another. So I needed to go back, I won't go into all the detail, I needed to go back to the moon for a couple reasons. Uh, closest only good, it, it, closest, it, it only counts in horseshoes, okay? I needed to cover that other 47,000 feet. Had I, had I never flown again, I still would have been extremely fortunate and lucky to have done what I did. But I needed to cover that other 47,000 feet. And I was determined, because I'd flown twice as, quote, a co-pilot, I was, I had to prove to myself, and I go into detail, and there's a lot of interesting facts about how I ended to get command of Apollo 17. But my goal was to go back to the moon and walk on the moon, but I had another significant and important goal, probably as important as actually stepping on the moon. And that was to command a flight. I needed to prove to myself I need to prove to you or anybody. I needed to prove to me whether I was good enough. Uh, you know, I, I, I knew I could do it, but I, I, I've always felt all my life, uh, to a degree, and I don't 
think there's anything wrong with being an underdog. I always felt that I was an underdog. I was one of the youngest guys selected. I never went to test pilot school. I didn't have enough jet hours. I didn't meet all of NASA's qualifications. That put me down here to start with. And, and, and I, needed to, I needed to find out whether I could do it. That's why I had to have not just the opportunity to step on the moon, but the opportunity to lead a team of people, take them back to the moon and see, number one, if I could do it, realizing that you got the whole reputation of the country on your shoulders because, you know, we, we could not accept failure. Plus the fact that it was a last flight to the moon and there were some people who just were saying, get home alive. We don't care whether you get land on the moon or not. You got a problem, just come home. We'll back you. Yeah, you know, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna go out there a second time not to land. Give me a break. But all they wanted to do was finish the Apollo program, and not lose anybody else. And think about this. Notwithstanding Apollo One, which never got off the ground, every mission we sent to the moon, every crew we sent to the moon, including Apollo Thirteen has come home to talk about it. Now think about that. I, I think that's a testimonial to, to the value of, of, of the commitment that America made to the quality of hardware they were building. Uh, you know, as I said, everybody took ownership of the screw they put in a spacecraft because that was not gonna fail. It was not gonna be their fault that you didn't succeed or didn't come home. Everyone who went to the moon has come home to talk about it. And, and as, I, as I think as I alluded to earlier, I'm not sure we really thought that was going to be the case. So here I am. I did get Apollo 17, the last flight. You know, and everyone was asking uh, all the press, well, you know, how does it feel to be the last man on moon? How does it feel to be the tail of the dog? How does it feel to be the last one over the fence? You know, I kept saying, hey, Apollo 17 is not the end, it's just the beginning of a whole new era in the history of flight, meaning Apollo itself was going to lead to the future, which I believed. Unfortunately, here we are, almost a half century later. Not only cannot we walk on the moon today, we can't even get an American in space on American hardware. How does that make you feel in 2014? Anyway, I wanted to make the best of it, and, and the, 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 the 11, no, the about 13 or 14 minutes from 50,000 feet on down to the surface is the most dynamic, overpowering, challenging, demanding 14, 15 minutes of your life. I mean, you're going you're gonna to land on the moon. You're decelerating to the lunar surface. And, uh, you know, a lot happens during that 14 minutes. There's a lot of noise, a lot of vibration. The ground is talking to you. You're your, your partner is talking to you about where you are, how much for you, all these things are going on. And, and, and you get down below some 200 feet, and we call that the dead man's curve. Because we had the ability to, uh, on the way down, we had two sections of the lunar module, the descent section and the ascent section, which we were going to use to get off the moon. But you could use that ascent sec section in case the descent module had problems or the engine failed, you could fire it on the way down and get back in orbit and get home. Of course, you didn't land. But once you got below 200 feet, you had to come down fast enough to keep from running out of fuel. But you had to come down with that rate of descent in control so when you got close to the ground, you could touch down softly. So 200 feet, you, you found yourself in a position where you didn't have enough time to fire that ascent engine and get out of there. You were going to hit the ground one way or the other. If the descent engine just quit, you were going to hit the ground. Uh, and so it, it gets a little interesting uh, down below 200 feet. And I, I uh, you know, I, I finally, you know, ground doesn't have anything to say. They can't do anything about it anyway. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm visually, you know, you got more technology in your iPhone today than I had in my hands when I landed on a moon. That's amazing. So what you mainly use is what you see in your brain. And that's one of the reasons we send humans. They can react to different situations. And so I, by that time, I knew where I was going to land. I was committed. I had 
change my landing site. We landed in a valley. This is important. And it, it was, it, every flight got more challenging, both the landing site and everything else we did longer. Uh, had mountains on three sides higher than the Grand Canyon is deep. Amazing. Valley was about 20 miles wide and about uh, five miles long. I, uh, the other 20 miles long and about five miles wide. It's a pretty challenging place. So, it, you know, once we hit 7,000 feet, we were down among them. We were truly below the tops of the mountains. And, uh, and I told Jack, I said, Jack, I don't want to hear anymore. He was telling me fuel, right, all these other things. I said, I don't want to hear anymore. I, I just, just got to focus on what I'm doing. And Apollo 17 was unique because we landed in the eastern, northeastern edge of the moon, which put the Earth above the mountains in the southwestern sky. Earth stayed there the whole time we were on the moon. It's just the dynamics of the Earth, moon, sun. And for most of the other guys who was up here, they didn't see it while they were landing. I had to contend, and, and I'm telling you, you can hardly take your eyes off the earth because you, it's just, you know, do you know where you are? That's the earth and you're out here in some strange science fiction world. And so I got the earth, I'm looking at where I'm landing, I've got to know how fast I'm coming down, I got to know how much fuel I got, but by the time you get below 200 feet, you're, you're committed. And, and when you get within about nine feet, uh, you have to shut the engine down because all this big heavy rocket pressure is coming from the engine when it gets close to the ground. You know, some of the engineers and safety consultants said, well, if you, if you land with the engine running, it's possible that the back pressure could explode. You know, it wouldn't have been a very good day. So you shut it down and you, <gasps> you drop that in the last nine feet. It's like going over a big bump on a country road, yeah. coming down. And then everything is quiet. There's no noise. There's no vibration. Nobody's talking. Oh, by the way, about 80 feet on the way down, your landing site gets obscured by dust. You're starting to blow the dust around. There's no more dust. And the dust is gone, the noise is gone. It's the most quiet, for me anyway, the most quiet moment I've ever experienced in my life. Now, the environmental control system is still churning to keep, you know, pressure in the, in, the, in the cabin. You don't hear it. I didn't. You know, Jack is over there like me, mesmerized, because now I'm looking out the window at these gigantic mountains, uh, the shadow of our, of our land, because the sun was, was behind us, a low morning sun, and you could see our shadow. And I'm looking down this valley, and, and I now had to, I had to accept the fact that I was, now seeing what had never been seen with human eyes before. I had, to, I had to contemplate the fact that I was where no human being had ever been before. You asked me a question of what it's like to step on a moon. Well, this is a precursor to doing that. And, you know, we got ready to go out and step on a moon. And stepping on a moon was important to me because, you know, I did it. No one could ever take those footsteps away from me, no matter what they wanted to believe. But the first steps had already been taken. They'd been taken by Neil and, and what, eight, nine or ten other guys before me, because I got out before Jack. He was actually the twelfth man to step onto the moon. Uh, they were important, but as I say, they, they'd been done before. I won't, i just say this. It was the last steps that were far more significant to me than the first steps. Uh, well, let me go into that real yeah, quick. Yeah, why? Well, I, you know, I started up the ladder, end of the third day. We would like to stay longer. We couldn't. I started up the ladder, and you got you to gotta visualize the environment which we are in. The sun had risen to not quite high noon, but high enough where you could feel it. Over the three days we were there, you could feel the heat penetrate your gloves. Uh, Shadows had changed, uh, but the Earth hadn't moved. It, it was always in that same spot. The Earth uh, uh, was literally full when we left, and now we're starting to recede and become more or less closer to a half Earth. So I'm starting up the ladder, and I look down at my footprints, and and you know I stayed there. For, I wanted to stop time. I wanted to hit the freeze button. 
let me stop and think about where I am and what I'm doing. And I looked down at my footprints, and I, I knew I wasn't coming back this way again. Somebody would, not me. And what did it all mean that we, not just Apollo 17, but we, Apollo, we, what did it mean that in our generation, in our time, we left our cradle and called another body in the universe our home, from Neil's first steps to my last. Uh, what did that mean? Uh, how, can, how can I answer the question, what's it like to go to the moon? Uh, I knew we were an extension of technology. We were on a scientific mission. We were studying geology. We wanted to, curiosity is the essence of human existence, so we wanted to get more answers and ended up with more questions. Uh, but what can I come back and tell you or future generations about. I wanted to, looking back at the Earth, and I've seen it going way back to Apollo 10, but not particularly from this vantage point and at this moment, but there the Earth was. Multicolored blues of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the oceans and the whites of the snow and the clouds on the mountains, and it, it was surrounded by this, this blackness, the, you know, not darkness, but blackness, emptiness, nothing. Infinity, I call it the endlessness of space and the endlessness of time. And there the Earth was three-dimensional. I mean, you can see, that it's not out there painted on a black background. It's within reach. I almost wanted to reach out, tuck it in here and bring it home and show it to you. And it's, it's the whole time we're there, it's rotating. It's not tumbling through space. It's moving with, with precision and purpose. And it, it's also rotating on an axis every 12 hours you're looking at the other side of the world while you're busy drilling holes and picking up rocks and so forth. But here it was, that period of time in my life has just come to an end. And uh, there it was. And, and, and I, I wanted to know, I wanted to come back and say, this is what it meant to go to do this during Apollo. This is why we did it. And I, I didn't come up with an answer and I still don't have one yet. What, what's the significance, what's the meaning of of, of, of Columbus sailing across the ocean. Did we know? Did we know a couple of years later? Did we know 50 years later? I'm not sure, I don't think so. What it meant for him to discover uh, this continent over here. And so maybe it'll be another 10 or 20 or 100 years before we realize that the important significance of what it meant to do what we did during Apollo. So I, I just, I kept thinking, you know what, I, I've been, I've been someplace special in my life, and I'm not sure, I'm not speaking for other people, but for me, I had a chance to sit on God's front porch and look back at a small part of the universe. I had the privilege looking back at the small part of the universe that he created. And, and I, I, I add to that, I don't care how you dress your God, I don't care by what name you call him, there is a creator, he is a God, uh, and, and he does exist, and he did create the world, because I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in that the world is an act, that, that, that the universe is an accident. I don't believe dust, two dust puddles, particles came together and created mass and energy in people. There has to be somebody bigger than you, bigger than me, who put it all together. And I had an opportunity to sit back, it's like looking at him, at a, at a painting of some kind, as something that he created this painting, the small part of it. The rest of it is still jillions of miles away. And someday we'll get maybe a, maybe we'll get a different front porch to look back on. So first steps, last steps, a lot more nostalgia, a lot more memory. Uh, and they certainly encompassed perhaps the most significant memory I have of going to the moon, and that's just looking back home. You know, I don't want to take anything away from anybody who's just flown in Earth orbit, but you don't see the world. You fly around it. You fly over a river, a coastline. You know, maybe you get a, 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 a view of your own hometown. See, see in, in one day, you'll see 16 most magnificent, beautiful sunsets and sunrises, you know, in a 24-hour day. But when you head on out there, for a rendezvous with this thing that's over here somewhere, and three days later, you're gonna miss it by 50 miles, and then call it your home for the next three days. That's a different space program. 
-hmm. It's different technologically, it's different scientifically, it's different philosophically, and it's different spiritually. It's different. You don't see the earth until you leave it. And we haven't left it for 41 years. Did you feel that way uh, before you stepped on the moon? No, About? because you don't. Or did it just? You don't know what to expect. Yeah. Those feelings come to you. Uh, I mean, about the Creator. Yeah, about yeah. Well, yeah, Apollo a 10. I, yeah, when I went out, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm Catholic, you know, I'm one of those Easter, Christmas Eve time, sometime Catholics. I went to church as a kid all the time. I believe in God, uh, but I also believe in God, that, that, that God put us, gave us the intelligence and a wherewithal do, to do with our lives that which we want. You want to lay in front of an 18-wheeler? That's not God's choice, that's your choice. And, and so that's when I went out the first time to the moon. Because, in, in, as I say, in, in, in Earth, when you see the Earth for the first time when you're headed out to the moon, it's, it's overwhelming. You, you know, you pinch yourself, do I know where I am at this more, moment in space and time and history? And do you know what you're looking at? Can you comprehend what you what you're, can, I mean, and, and it's, like I say, it's, it's real, it's, it's three-dimensional, it's dynamic, it's life, it's love, it's past, it's history, it's everything you know. You're not looking at a map. This is not going to look looking at a globe on somebody's desk. This is it. Uh, as close to science fiction as you'll ever get, and you're, you're just, coasting out there away from it and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets to the point where you can cover it up with your thumb. You, that's, those, are, those are big time things to, to comprehend and accept. Yeah. So on Apollo 10, I, yeah, I came to the conclusion, even though I didn't land on the moon, that there's something I've never been exposed to before. There's something I don't understand, that, that this is not an accident. This is not that this had to be created in somebody's mind, some creator himself. Uh, so I, I went back to the moon on Apollo 17 with that in mind, to either reinforce or say, oh, you were just on a dream mission. And then I reinforced that feeling. It's, it's so powerful to try and accept and realize where you are looking back at the Earth. And so, yeah, I just reinforce that feeling. And then you get on a moon. Don't forget, all my other flights all have been into zero gravity. When I made that first step on the moon, for the first time in my life, and there's only 12 people who have done it, I'm stepping on something that is not Earth. But here it is. I can feel it. It's not Earth. Think about that. I'm out there somewhere, and this is not Earth. That's Earth. And then you're imagine. standing there, and, and the mountains are clearly in view because you're in daylight surrounded by a paradox. You're standing in daylight surrounded by the blackness of space, not darkness, the blackness of space. And on top of that, out there is that thing we call home. You, got, it, you know, it, it takes some, yeah. Some deep breaths to suck that all up. And, and so, yeah, each step I took beyond Apollo 10, I just reinforced my feelings about, about what I believe. And I do also believe that I, if I could take every human being on this earth and stand them next to me for two minutes on the surface of the moon and see and perhaps feel what I felt, the world might be a different place to live in. I don't care. Like I said, I don't care who your God is, you cannot deny what you're looking at. That's just me. You've been so generous to share w with us and with the public those feelings that you had, and, um, and also to share your, your papers with the, with the university, with the libraries. And I want to ask well, you... Well, let me say something yeah, about that sure. while I'm ill. Uh, you know, how we got to this archive of you know, Neil's and my stuff particularly, is uh, 
I guess, Tracy, before you were here, I got a call, maybe from Dean Mullen, somebody said, we would like you to consider donating your papers to Purdue. And, yeah, one of my papers. Well, what is Purdue on? What, you know, big deal. I don't know what it is, but I was really honored that you would want, you know, when I was described what kind of stuff, that you'd even want that stuff. And so that started the ball rolling. And then uh, Mr. Hilton, uh, Baron Hilton, who people, who people look at as the innkeeper of the world, uh, is a good friend of Neil Armstrong's and mine. And I don't often ask people to, to donate to any particular cause. I don't, I, don't, I don't really, that's not my bag. But this was so important to me that one day, Neil, when Neil and I talked about it, and I said, I'm going to go to Barron, I'm going to talk to him about the archives and tell him what it's about. And Barron has, uh, has uh, three passions and one is not being an innkeeper. It's hunting, fishing, and flying. And that was his affinity to Neil and myself. And uh, he's always been very generous to everybody who was straight up with him. And, you know, he gets hit from do this. And I said to Baron, I said, you know, there's a couple things going on. One was a major educational program down at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola that Neil and I are involved in. And another one is because we both went to Purdue that you're going to archive our papers. And I'm just wondering if you would like to be part of that by participating uh, in, this, in this particular program, uh, you know, so financially helping us. And he thought about it. He said, Gene, if it's Neil and you, I know that it's for real. And if it's archiving things for future generations, to be, perhaps be inspired by what you've done in your life, I, I absolutely, I want to help. And that led to, I they did a, a, a lot of um, due diligence and so forth, but that led to, to Mr. Hilton, uh, who, who there, there's a big foundation in his father's name who um, support these kinds of things, to donating uh, $1 million to the archives, and Baron Hilton himself, out of his own pocket, out of his own bank account, I think primarily because of Neil and myself, uh, donated another million dollars. And that was, that, was, that was special for him to do that. He's a special friend, but it, it meant something to Neil and it meant something to me, and that's why I, I like to think uh, it means something to Purdue, and that's why I like to see his name on it, because, you know, he is, he is just as much a, 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 a builder of this country. His father was. His father started Hilton Hotels from a little hotel in a little town in Texas, and he's given to this country as much as any of us have been to the moon have given to the country. So to see him associated with something that's got Amelia Earhart, Neil Armstrong, and Gene, Gene Cernan. Cernan. Yeah, is, 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 is special to me, and I know it's special to him. He, otherwise, he wouldn't have done it. Anyway, I just needed to, yeah. that, that, that's sort of the, the history of how I got here, uh, you know, with the archives. And, and actually, my last question was going to be, what are your hopes and dreams for the archive? For, for how can we make you proud? You know, well, you already have, but I, I, you know, at this point in my life, uh, I'm finding out over the years that uh, that that I've been attracted to you know, young kids. How did it feel? What did it look like? Were you scared? And that's what inspired me to write a book. Uh, and it, and I've got a lot of positive response from it. Uh, and, and I found out that in talking to a group of kids, if one out of ten kids remembers what you said, you walk home a winner. You know, do your best. Someday you're going to surprise yourself. Always shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you're going to land among the stars. Dream the impossible, then go out and make it happen. Uh, you know, 
you, you, sh you, you share with them, you try and get into their world and share with them and give them the answers. Why you? Who are you? Or just a kid from Chicago who had immigrant grandparents and grew up in a very middle class family who had a dream. And, and so I find myself, I, I, I need to pay back. And, and helping, you know, trying to inspire kids to, to dream and, 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 you know, young educational programs, whether it's STEM or history or whatever it is, is part of that. But the other thing is the archives. Uh, you know, what you showed me this morning really overwhelmed me. Uh, the, the, the reason, from my point of view, for the archives is not to say, man, we got a lot of stuff in that, in that locked door, behind that locked door, a lot of boxes. The thing is to, the bottom line is, is hopefully that these kids will identify with a piece of history which can be theirs in the future. It can inspire them to do things they didn't know they could do. They can see and feel a piece of something that, that they are a descendant of by being an American. Uh, and that's a real goal. They, you know, they're, they're making a, a documentary uh, out of my book and out of my life, and I, I uh, refused to allow that to happen for about four or five years. But a gentleman who was passionate after he read my book said, said, Gene, you owe it to future generations, 10 and 15 and 20 or more years down the line, to tell them your story. It's not about you, I've been told, it's not about me, it's the story that counts. Just a young kid during World War II who had a dream and lived a fairy tale. And, and that's the way I feel about the archives. That's why I feel about, I don't have any more to give. I'm not going back to the moon, I'm not going to Mars. Even if there was a chance to do it tomorrow morning, I'm not going. And, and it's too selfish of any of us to say, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for this. And, and you know, I've, I, you know, Tracy, you and I talked about, I got so many of these things that literally, I guess, have significance to you and future generations. Papers and books and high school books and whatever, books from Purdue here. Uh, then what am I gonna do with anyway, you know? You're helping me clean out my garage. <laughs> but it's, it's an honor that to, to, to think that I'm in the, you know, that you'd want my personal stuff, my personal feelings. It's an honor to give you this oral history and share some of my feelings, because I'm just one of many. And, and, and be in the same room with stuff from Amelia Earhart, and so many people from Purdue have done so many other things, and to share some of those shells with with Neil Armstrong, I mean, this, this Neil Armstrong truly is a unique, special icon in the history of the world, of the world, not the country, the world. And I think he needs to be recognized that. And for me to have a box with my name on, on the same shelf as Neil Armstrong, that's, that's hot, that's tall cotton. It's such an honor to have, to have, to be speaking with you and to have such support that you give us, Captain Cernan. I can't thank you enough. Well, we, we need to do this again for the fairy tale continues on, because, <laughs> you know, here I am. I just turned 80. God. Happy oh, birthday. <laughs> old Phil Harris said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd take better care of myself. <laughs> you know, I got, you know, I've, I've been through the trials and tributes of, a, you know, I had second marriage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I now, as a result of that, I have uh, nine great, nine, not great grandchildren, but nine mm -hmm. really great kids, and oh, my cool. grandkids, nine of them. Uh, I'm so proud. They don't. They're. 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 What's what I feel good about? They're all their own, and I, and I was married a second time before any of them were born. <laughs> and uh, they're all their own person. Everything they've accomplished is not because their granddad went to the moon. It's because maybe they listen to me in terms of what I learned from my father. You know, get out there and do your best and you're gonna surprise yourself. I got one graduating from Texas A&M who could barely get in there and now she's excelled. I got one just selected 
it, it's just uh, accepted to the Naval Academy, as well as Purdue Great. and Texas A&M. Uh, I got the others that are that are, are are state swimming champions. I got you know it's it's so my life has changed. That 13 years is 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 here somewhere, right. and and you know you're bringing it back to me, uh, it, it, and I'll never escape it. You know when. Once you do something like that, you're never gonna, you're never gonna turn your back on it. And uh, but my life has changed. You mature. You look at different things a little differently. But uh, it, but as I said, I, I'm I'm proud just to know that I can perhaps contribute to some of the future of some of these kids, particularly at Purdue. But there's a whole country of those kids out there that need to know what we're capable of, what we did, what they can do if they want to do it badly enough, if they believe in themselves. Uh, and that's all we were. We were, we were we, no one was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. We all were given an opportunity to do something unique and different, and we all responded, perhaps some in different ways, but as I said, we did it, and that's what's important. And the fact that you're archiving some of this stuff to tell the story to future folks like this was my daughter. Oh, yeah. This was my daughter when she was yeah. nine years old. I, I went to the on Apollo 17. You know, she's got three grown daughters now, believe it or not. And, you know, and she, you know, she was six, six, uh, three, six, and nine when I flew. Three is too young to understand. Yeah. Six was old enough to understand, but, uh, but, too young to care. Nine, very much involved in her daddy's yeah. flight. This particular bring back some brings I back her memory. Picture. She was on a Today Show back then, and she was asked a question by the host Jim Hartz, and that's a that's actually you. black and white picture of me walking on the moon at that yeah. moment, and she's looking at it, yeah, and uh, and he said, uh, you know. He said, I don't know how the question was, but he said do you, something about, do uh, you think your daddy will find water on the moon? And here's a nine-year-old saying, well, if he did, he went to the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, 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 it's a different world I live in now than I lived in then. You know, it, it, you know you're bulletproof, you're mm -hmm. arrogant, don't tell me I can't do it kind of thing. Well, that's not all bad. You know, you, we none of us ever looked in the mirror and said, "Man, you're the best." But by God, if you didn't think you could do it better than it's ever been done before, you should have been doing something else. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of attitude it took to do what we did a half a century ago. And that's the attitude that I think kids got to understand. They're, and they're just—I'm telling you—they're not just as good. They're head and shoulders over us from a technology point of view. They got more tools in their hands today, by far than we had to do what we did. The, the technology to go to the moon didn't exist when Kennedy challenged us to go. We had to create it. We had to test it. We had, and, and, and we, we screwed up along the way. But I, I tell kids also, don't be afraid to try. Because if you're afraid to try, you'll never succeed. And if you don't succeed, you'll never know how good you are or good you can be. There's so much peer pressure today on these younger generations uh, that they, they tend to back off sometimes. Go for it. Go for the gold. Yeah. It's out there. That's where I am today. And that's where we hope we can inspire kids who come to the archives and see what you did and what yeah. all of you've done. I hope, so, I, I, hope I can be here again and, and do this again because, yeah. you know, there's a lot that's transpired between where we finished here and yeah. not that people are going to yeah. be interested in, but while I'm around, while I'm alive, I guess we ought to Get well, it down. This fall, we hope to have, we will Great. have an exhibit, so Let's I hope it. you'll be Great. able to come back I'll and do join it. us. I'll do it. I'll be. Okay. Tracy, thank, thank you, you so much. You're Captain doing Sir. a wonderful job. Thank you. It's a great honor. My pleasure.